So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome again to this uh, Lenten lecture series uh, about ecological conversion with uh, Father Peter Knox. We, I would like to remind you again to please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them on the on the chat uh, chat box there, and then uh, when Father Peter Knox has finished his presentation, he will uh, respond to your questions. And uh, Dr. Knox, over to you. Thank you so much again for for availing yourself for these uh, uh, lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Dr. Rampe Shlobo from your parish in Orlando West, St. Martin de Porres in Orlando West. And welcome again to everybody. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time this week, it's very it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Dr. Shlobo didn't mention that these, this lecture series is presented by the Social Apostolate Desk of the Society of Jesus in Southern Africa and by the Jesuit Institute. I, I work at the Jesuit Institute, and so it's a collaboration between two Jesuit works. Um, we're in the third of our series of six, so today is the 5th of March. We have another three lectures to go. Um, and it's a, just a one hour lecture. We'll try to finish. We'll respect your time and finish by eight o'clock. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is how we're going. In our first lecture, we spoke, we had a general introduction. Yesterday, last week, we spoke about creation, creation as a, as a work of God. And we looked at um, two biblical narratives, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and we looked at two more modern, more contemporary narratives of creation, namely um, Big Bang Theory and the theory of evolution. Today we're going to look at the tradition before Pope Francis. Many people have said that Pope Francis is doing something new, that he's sort of taking the church in a new direction, he's focusing on a new concern, which... And then some people have, have read Laudato Si, Pope Francis' encyclical on care for our common home, and they've said that Pope Francis is really trying to convert the church away from, or convert the world away from capitalism into a more communist or socialist kind of world. And what I hope to do today is to show all of us that, in fact, Pope Francis is part of a tradition, a very, very long-standing tradition of the church. Uh, going back really to the very first centuries, 2000 years ago, when the church and when Christianity started taking our environment seriously. So that's my, that's my proposal for this evening. Next week, we'll look at the reasons to care for our common home, what's actually going on, what's going wrong. And so next week, it's 12th of March, we'll look at what's going on with our common home, which is really one chapter of Pope Francis's encyclical. The 19th of March, we'll look at the tradition from Catholic social teaching. We've got lots and lots of years of wisdom, of accumulated wisdom about care for our common home and care for the people who share our common home with us. And then finally, on the, in the final lecture, we'll look at what we can do. We as individual Catholics or individual Christians or individual human beings living on the planet, and members of various societies and organizations and social groupings, what we can do to respond to the care for our common home and what we can do as part of our ongoing conversion. Conversion doesn't just happen once in a, in a snap of a finger. Conversion is something which is ongoing and it, it lasts for our whole lives. Those of you who may not have kind of got into the Lenten um, cycle yet. There are a couple of things you can do if you want to make this a more ecologically friendly Lent for yourself and for your families and for your communities. There's a Lenten calendar which is put out by the Laudato Si Lent um, website, where which has a very simple thing that we can do day by day. Look at our food, look at our transport, um, consider the garden, consider the lilies, as Jesus says, this calendar is a very, very simple calendar for each day during Lent. Alternatively, the Ignatian Solidarity Network is proposing other things that we might do during Lent. I'm not going to dwell on that. Let's go to the early history of Christianity. 
looking at care for our common home, going right the way back to the beginning of Christianity. Since the earliest days, I suggest, Christians have been concerned with the environment in which we live. Remember, Jesus uses a lot of ecological or nature-based parables and stories. He tells the story of the wheat and the weeds sown together in the same field. You don't rip up the weeds. You allow them to grow side by side with the, with the weeds. He tells stories about birds and animals. Consider the lilies. Consider nature. See how much God cares for everything that's in creation around us, how much more does God care for us and love us? Um, Christianity, as you know, began in Palestine, which is now contested, Palestine, Israel, which is now very contested. During the time of Jesus, it was on the eastern fringe, oh, that should be eastern, on the eastern fringe of the Roman Empire, way over on the eastern Mediterranean. It was very, very arid. We have lots of pictures of stories of Jesus going into the desert and Jesus being in the desert, in the wilderness. And so it wasn't the lush Spain or Italy or France. It was a very, very uh, arid place. The Roman Empire required, as modern capitalists, em capitalist empires require, to expand and to expand and to expand, to get more resources. The resources which the Roman Empire particularly required was, um, was silver, and they used silver, they got gold as well. They used slaves. They used not only cheap labor, but completely unpaid labor, where human lives were worthless, or where human lives had a financial value, and slavery was part of the, part of the capitalist system of the Roman Empire at the time. That was a system as you notice the comparison with modern um, um, capitalism, it's premised on expansion. It has to grow and grow and grow all the time. Christians were opposed to this expansionism, this oppression of the Romans or by the Romans. They, were, they went along with slavery for a while, but then eventually Christians uh, said that slavery is unjust. Christians responded by trying to make communities much, much more um, sharing, much, much more um, horizontal, much, much more engaged in the welfare of each other. They, they kind of opposed domination and they kind of proposed a kind of ecological restoration. Let's look after, let's care for our environment. The followers of Jesus were opposed to the Roman conquest and the Roman expansion. They resisted this anthropo anthropocentric, this consumerist lifestyle which Rome was presenting, which was regarded as the paradigm of a good life. The more comfortable you are, the more slaves, the more food, the more drink, the more partying you can do. This was kind of somewhat opposed by early Christians. And they wanted to integrate a balance in their lifestyle, in their interactions with non-human life forms. So Christians didn't buy into the Roman economy. This is taken, or this last paragraph is taken from the master's thesis in, of a particular student called Amanda Lynn Barker at the University of Huddleston in, the, in Northern California. Um, so, sorry, Humboldt University in Northern California. You can find her thesis on the internet, and I found that very, very informative. If we go three or four hundred years into Christianity, we see that those early years were marked by persecution, not just in the Roman Empire, but also persecution in Egypt, for example, persecution of Christians because of what they stood for, because of the way they cared, because of the way they opposed the deification, the elevation to the status of God of the Roman emperors or the, the emperors of the time. So you see here Christians being fed to the lions. This was great entertainment 
for many of the many of the people of the Roman Empire. So Christians being devoured by lions, they're busy praying there, they're possibly their final prayer. Christians being crucified in the model of Jesus, Christians being burnt alive. There was enormous persecution of Christians in the first three centuries of our faith. So let's jump to a more stable time when Christianity is more settled when it's the religion of the Western Empire, the Roman Empire. Let's jump into the 5th century when we have Benedict of Nursia, who is now canonized as a saint. He's the founder of the Benedictine monastic movement, which has both nuns and monks. So it's men and women following the rule of Benedict. And they really try to live off the land off the farm and in relation to the land with a benign relationship with the land. Here we have monks in modern day France, they're harvesting lavender. Okay, and so they're living off the land, they're not dominating the land, they're not oppressing the land, hopefully. They've got crops here, but you can see the crops are also surrounded by trees. So it's not a pure monoculture. There's there's a kind of there's an intercropping not not tight intercropping, but there's a relationship between the nature, that is the natural woods, and their fields. And they have a very benign relationship with nature. There are two mottos associated with the Order of St. Benedict, the Benedictine monks and nuns. First one is Pax. You join the monastery for peace. Peace, a relationship with the world, a relationship with your brothers or sisters, which is a peaceful relationship. It's not competitive. It's not sort of trying to get more and more and more. It's a relationship of being satisfied with what you have. And then the Benedictine way of life, which is also elevated into a kind of um, motto for the Benedictine life, is this: these two we know, prayer and work, but also reading. So reading the scriptures, praying and working. And this is the rhythm. This is the kind of balanced rhythm of the Benedictine monastic movement. Let's jump 700 years from St. Benedict into the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Um, Francis of Assisi is the, um, the saint associated with the ecological movement or with people who study and work in ecology. St. Francis of Assisi, as you know, the founder of the Franciscan religious family. He's an example for all of us oh, through the centuries of care for the vulnerable, care for the poor, care for the outcast, and care for the environment, care for our common home. He shows us a joy in living integral ecology. He relates to the brother, son, and sister moon, and sister mosquito, and um, the mice, and the rats, and the animals around him, the flowers, the plants. He said a monastery or a friary should always keep a part of their garden in a completely natural state, not being harvested, not being planted, just so that we can contemplate the world as God made it. So he shows us joy in living the simple lifestyle. He's the, the epitome of poverty that is not trying to get more and more and more, living in harmony with God, living in harmony with nature, and ultimately in harmony with himself. He shows us the bond between care for nature, care for justice, care for the poor, care for society at large, and care for our own developing of our own interior peace. The more we're in competition with nature or the natural environment, the more we're at dis-ease or unease with ourselves. He shows an intimate connection with every creature. And that's not just naive romanticism, which might have worked in the 12th and 13th centuries. This kind of care for and connection with nature is something that should be and can be determining even the choices we make now our behavior, we can think also along those ecological lines proposed by St. Francis of Assisi and say, my behavior can also be one in which I consider what's good for nature. And so it's not just an, something from hundreds of years ago, it's something that we can also do now. Here we have St. Francis depicted with his in his meeting in Damietta in Egypt during the fifth 
crusade. St. Francis is sick and tired of all the bloodletting and the killing and the, the horror of war where the Christians are trying to regain um, parts of Egypt for Christian, for Christian pilgrimage and things like that. Francis goes as a simple monk with his friend, um, whose name escapes me at the moment. He goes and speaks to the sultan who's in charge of the Egyptian army. The sultan was in fact the sultan of Israel, Palestine, Syria, and, and Egypt. And Francis just talks to him about faith, faith in God, love of God, God's care for us. And the sultan responds, uh, and the sultan gives him great hospitality, and Francis and the sultan have some kind of interreligious dialogue, and he's the model for us of interreligious dialogue. Francis returns to, to the, the Christian forces. He speaks to them about kind of the benign people here, these religious people whom he met. Francis saw them praying five times a day, and he's trying to tell his Christian uh, crusaders that these Muslims are very, very religious and pious people. Francis falls sick. He has to return to Italy. The, the Christians don't hear Francis's argument. They advance on Alexandria. They camp in the Nile River. The Sultan opens the dams and the Nile gets flooded. The Christians get stuck in the in the Nile River, and the Sultan didn't kind of drown them all, but in fact he sent food to the Christians to nourish them while they were getting out of the bog which the Nile River had become. So here you have the Sultan using natural means to fight on his behalf, but also the Sultan who's who's not a great warmonger and trying to kill all the Christians at the first opportunity. He had been converted as he had his conversation with St. Francis, and Francis in turn is able to convert all of us. Let's, and so Pope Francis, Pope Francis writes about St. Francis of Assisi uh, in his encyclical Laudato Si. You can find this quotation in Laudato Si, chapter, uh, paragraph 11. Um, Pope Francis says we can be cut off from the world, that's that whole bit there, if we feel, however, intimately united with the whole of creation, everything that exists, then sobriety and care for the world will well up inside of us. If we really care for the world, then that care will continue to grow up inside of us spontaneously. If we really care for the world, uh, then we refuse to turn reality into an object we refuse to objectify reality simply to use it and control it for ourselves. And so Pope Francis is quoting the example of St. Francis of Assisi, saying that we feel, the more connected we feel with our world, our environment, the more we'll kind of respect its right to exist by itself. In Laudato Si, chapter tw uh, paragraph 12, Pope Francis continues about St. Francis. Um, St. Francis sees nature as a magnificent book in which God speaks to us about God's self. God grants us ability to see through nature what, what God is like. So the Lord reveals himself, herself. The divinity reveals divinity in the, in the nature, in the natural world. And so we see God's eternal power. St. Paul says, if you consider the world, that will tell us something about God. So Francis, Pope Francis, quoting St. Francis, look at nature to see about God. Let's jump another 800 years to the time of um, Pope Paul VI. He's the first modern pope who writes about ecology and creation, care for creation. Here we see him on his first visit to Africa, where he's talking to President Milton Obote of Uganda. So Pope Francis, sorry, Pope Paul VI was the first pope during my lifetime. He was pope from 1963 to 1978. Um, so two years into his papacy, he goes to the Food and Agriculture Organization in the United States, in the United, yeah, in the United States, in New York. You know that the Food Department of the United Nations, so he's busy speaking to the United Nations, 
And he's saying this agricultural revolution of the 1960s is all very good. This wonderful kind of expansion of agriculture is all very good. But we have to be very, very careful because there are dangerous reper repercussions in the balance of nature. The more you grow food, the more you kind of um, you drain the wetlands, the more you plant selective uh, strains of food and things like that, the more danger you have of getting repercussions from the natural world. And he says, we continue along that line, we risk a dangerous ecological, ecological capacity, uh, catastrophe. There are problems if we try to dominate nature too much, nature will eventually be unable to continue supporting uh, human activity. He continues in his spe speech to the, uh, to the Food and Agriculture Organization. He talks about pollution of the air, the water, the food. He says that this is a major problem. Um, we need to change. Now, if you remember the title or the theme of this uh, series of lectures is ecological conversion. And we'll hear that in the next couple of popes who are going to be speaking to us this evening. We need to change. We need a radical change conversion in our behavior. So the behavior of all humanity. We need to change. We can't continue on the same trajectory. Pope Paul VI is saying this already uh, 52, 54 years ago in the United Nations. We need to change. He says we have learned how to dominate. Now we have to learn to dominate our domination. We have to control our domination of the world. We cannot continue with this idea that we will continue to dominate and conquer nature itself. So that, if we've got it in us, if it's in our blood, if it's in any way we look towards nature, we look to our back garden and we feel we have to organize this and organize that and get rid of this and chop that tree down and get rid of the rats or whatever, we have to learn to dominate our tendency to dominate. And this is Paul VI, Paul VI's message to the Food and Agriculture Organization. In his, uh, in his encyclical on the 80th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, so the 80th anniversary of the beginning of Catholic social teaching, he says that we're so connected with nature, we're so united to what's going on in the world, that we are becoming a victim of the degradation of nature. We're becoming, we're caught up in the difficulties that nature is undergoing. Um, and as we continue with our technocratic paradigm, as we continue with our domination of nature, we're creating an environment which will become probably intolerable for us. So there's this modern theory of planetary boundaries. As we approach planetary boundaries, as we exceed the boundaries of the world, then life becomes unbearable for us. And already in 1971, that's 53 years ago, Pope, John, Pope Paul VI is warning us against making the world unbearable for us. And that doesn't just concern the wealthy. It doesn't just concern the poor. Pope Paul VI says this is a problem for the entire human family. And so he's saying, again, part of our conversion, part of our ecological conversion, we have to take responsibility. We have to take the destiny of humankind, the destiny which is shared by all people, and we have to do something about it. We can't just carry on with business as usual. Then in 1972, you may remember I mentioned it last week, the Stockholm Conference, uh, 1972, uh, the very, very first United Nations Conference on um, the human environment. So Pope Paul sent a message because he's a member, the, United, the, the Holy See is a member, at least an observer member of the United Nations. And he's saying again that our relationship with the environment is inseparable. We cannot be cut off from the environment. We're part of the environment. We're not above it. We're not cut off from it. We're not anywhere else apart from in our environment. We have to begin to respect the laws of nature. Nature takes time to regenerate. Nature has capacity for regeneration, but we have to start respecting those laws of nature. We can't overrule the laws of nature. Humans and the environment are united. We share a common future. 
So if you think of the trees, if you think of the birds, if you think of the oceans, if you think of wherever you live, the city you're in or whatever, we share a future with our natural environment, our urban environment, and the environment of everybody around us. And he's saying that, he's quoting this now, he's looking at secular society, he's looking at the United Nations itself, which is having this conference in Stockholm on the human environment. And he's saying that humans in general, secular society, has found a new respect for the biosphere, that is for life on the world, on the planet. And he says, we Christians also have to respect the biosphere. We jump uh, from the papacy of John Paul, John from Paul the Sixth. We skip John Paul the First. We go to John Paul the Second. You, some of you who live in South Africa, may remember this occasion when he visited South Africa and he celebrated Mass for us at Gospel Park. You may even remember recognize some of our bishops here. Certainly, our president. You can remember Isok Pahad. We can remember him. So John Paul II, he had a very long papacy. Here we have 17 years of, of John Paul II's papacy. And he gave us a lot of teaching on the environment. Within the, first, um, within the first couple of years of his papacy, he's already giving us in his World Day of Peace message, he says we have to look at our lifestyle. We have to take a serious look at our lifestyle. Our lifestyle is premised on instant gratification, on consumerism. Take, 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 buy, 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 get more and more and more. And while we're doing that, we're remaining indifferent to the damage that we're causing to the environment. The more we, the more cell phones we own, the more computers or motor cars, or the more land we take over and dominate, that's causing damage to the environment. And people seem to be growing indifferent to that. And he says this is a moral crisis. And what is needed in a moral crisis is conversion. In his encyclical, his very first encyclical on Jesus, the redeemer of humankind, so his first encyclical was Redemptor Hominis about Jesus, who's the redeemer of us. He mentions, so it's not all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He looks at the human condition and says, look at the way the humans are exploiting the earth. And he says that we really have to slow down and start planning, looking seriously at the trajectory of the earth, looking at the trajectory of humankind and start planning. planning. Um, if we don't have a a kind of very humanistic plan, a plan which values human life, this will bring us into a threat with our natural environment. It will alienate us in our relationship with nature, and it will cut us off from nature. Very often people see no other meaning in the natural environment than what serves for our immediate need and our consumption. And he's saying this is not good. We can't just look at nature as though it were to... Uh, source, which is just to feed, 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 and help us to consume more and more. So this is in the second year of his papacy. He's already coming and saying, people, we need to change the way we look at nature. In his encyclical on the hundredth year of Rerum Novarum, that is the hundredth year of, of the beginning of Catholic social teaching, he says that the, the problem of ecology is the problem of consumerism. He says the ecological issue is an issue about consumerism. And it's based on an anthropological problem. We don't understand ourselves anymore. We people have seemed to have lost the plot. We don't know who we are. We think we are, uh, I am because I consume, because I enjoy, because I own. I am because I go shopping. I am because I buy. He says this is a problem of the human understanding of itself. We think all we have to do is to have and to enjoy rather than to be and to grow. And he says this is disordered and excessive. It's a problem with our anthropology. Um, he says that humans very often presume that they are the masters of the earth, the universe, and they forget that God is the one who put it there in the first place. God is, God gave us the gift of creation. God, this is a prior gift, and God is the one who's there. We're not the kind of cause of our own being. Um, 
And we forget that God has given purpose to nature and that nature has its own needs. Um, it has its own requisites. Nature needs to be tended and cared for and cherished and uh, looked after. We can't just presume it's there to give, give, give all the time. Rather than being cre uh, creators or we've created ourselves, we have to see ourselves as cooperators with God in the work, work of ongoing creation. Um, anything like anything less than that will cause some kind of rebellion. So Pope John, John Paul II, in saying that nature will rebel, well, it's not really about nature rebelling. It's just that we will perceive nature is giving up on us. And he says, so here's John Paul II saying that we need a change of lifestyle. We need to convert. We need to a metanoia. We need a transformation of the way we look at the world. Then in the year 20, what year is that? 2001, in his catechesis on creation, he says that God is probably disappointed. When God looks down from heaven, looks at humans on the earth, God is probably disappointed because God's expectations of the intelligent human beings has not been fulfilled. Pope John, the, John Paul II uses this term, which we associate with Pope Francis, but in fact, John Paul II speaks of ecological conversion. And he says we need to be more consensitive to the catastrophe which is coming our way. We must stop. We mustn't go to the edge of the abyss. We must stop before the abyss. And uh, we must pay attention to the world and to the problems of the world, the limitations of the world. Then we have, after John Paul II, we have Pope Benedict. We may remember him very well. Some people call him the Green Pope. In a way, he was more influenced by the Green Movement in Germany. Uh, and the Greens were very strong in Germany as a political force, but also as a, as a sociological force and, an, and a, even a, a psychological force within Germany. And he was influenced by that, the German Pope. Um, he was the first pope, for example, to make the world, uh, to make the Vatican have a balanced carbon footprint. That's his intention. That was his plan. He would be, be the first state in the world to have a balanced carbon footprint. He installed solar panels on the roof of the Paul VI auditorium, the vast auditorium within the Vatican. He committed to... Um, to going completely electric and the Vatican fleet of vehicles is coming to the point, maybe maybe in the year 2030, 2025, next year, all of the vehicles in the Vatican will be electric vehicles. So there'll be no, no um, carbon dioxide emissions from the Vatican vehicles. He banned non-organic pesticides, nitrates and phosphates, which cause enormous damage to the soil. He denounced also neo-paganism, like in Germany, people became very, very concerned about ecology, as though ecology was the new religion. And Pope Bennett says, no, ecology is important, but we have to remember that God is the religion. God is the creator of ecology. And so that's Pope Benedict. Um, in 2007, he gave a, an address to diplomats, welcoming the new diplomats to Rome and speaking to the existing diploma, diplomats. Here he's also talking about changing our way of life. Okay, Hunger in the world is unacceptable. Hunger is about imbalance, complete imbalance. We need to change our way of life. We need to eliminate the structural causes of global economic dysfunction. Now, people accusing Pope Francis, his successor, of being a communist or being a socialist or whatever, but here we have Benedict and before him, Pope John Paul II, saying we need to change the world's economic system. It's dysfunctional, it's not working. We have to kind of find mo models of growth which work, that respect the environment. And so, again, it's not just personal conversion, but he's talking about global economic conversion in respect, in, in honor of the, of the environment. His final encyclical, Charity in Truth, you might think it's all about love and things like that, or truth, it's, it's highly, highly theological, but here Pope Benedict is being his most practical in his final encyclical before he retired. Uh, we have to review our lifestyle. 
The way humanity treats the environment influences the way we treat ourselves. There's a kind of reciprocity. If we don't care for the environment, we don't care for other human beings. If we look after the environment, we're going to look after one another. Um, we have to review our lifestyle. We have to review the way we care for the environment. Hoarding resources, particularly water, can generate conflicts. And so and we, we see there are conflicts and we expect further conflicts over water, over food, over all sorts of over minerals, we see that in the in the east of the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, people are getting more and more and more, and there's great competition for the minerals which African Africa can provide. If we come to peace, then that'll probably protect nature as well, and it'll help society's uh, well-being. And he just points out. I mean, he's obviously been through the Second World War. He's seen all the wars in the North, global North. He's seen the wars taking place in Africa, how nature is destroyed and squandered by wars. Then he talks to the clergy in this diocese, kind of on the northern border of Italy, close to the German, close to Germany. Uh, he has this talk here, and he says, the brutal consumption of creation begins where God is not. So what he means is where God is not, he's talking about hell, he's talking about sin. This brutal consumerism is sinful, he's telling us. We make ourselves the ultimate uh, point of reference. We're wasting creation. We no longer recognize any needs superior to our own. We sort of put our, our own needs or demands or wants or desires at the top of humanity, at the top of our agenda. And there's no longer any concept of life beyond death. So that's why we have to consume, 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 buy, buy, hold, hold, possess, possess, because there's nothing after this. There's no kind of spiritual life which continues after death. And he's saying that um, we have to continue, uh, we have to kind of think of the world as something which is just contingent. It's going to pass. Pope John, Pope Francis, in, in, in Laudato Si, he quotes bishops' conferences from all over the world. And I think we should be honored that he quotes first. Of all the bishops' conferences around the world, he quotes our Southern African Catholic Bishops' Conference. They made a statement on the environment in 1999. Okay, so, and Pope Francis is quoting the statement of our own Catholic bishops in Southern Africa on the environment. He's saying that our bishops are saying that all damage to the environment is a problem, which calls for prompt and creative responses. It calls for changes. It calls for ways of dealing with the problem of destroying nature. Everybody's talents are needed to redress the damage which human abuse of creation is doing. And our bishops say that the survival of the human race and of creation depends on this. The bishops in 1999 were responding particularly to the, the mining industry and the mining sector, but they're kind of making a broader statement on the environment that, that it really all, everything depends on our care for nature. The German bishops have made two particular statements on the environment. The first one in which they identify the future of creation with the future of humankind. So if there's no creation left, if there's no nature left, there's no humankind left, okay? They're talking about energy supply, but they're looking really far into the future and saying, we destroy nature, we destroy humanity. And then much more recently, 18 years ago, they're talking about climate change and they're saying that this is a hot topic and will continue to be a hot topic in global justice, in intergenerational justice and in ecological justice. Then in 1991, the World Council of Churches, that is the churches, the Orthodox, the Protestant, and the mainline, mainline churches, they say that they've been severely lacking in a biblically informed theology of creation. And at their meeting in 1991, they decided they need to work on a new theology, a theology which takes creation seriously as a protagonist, and a theology that's relevant to the ecological crisis that we're facing. They point out that the evangelical Christians among themselves, so the World Council of Churches includes many evangelical churches, they say they, these evangelicals don't have any kind of reflection on nature, on the environment. 
and they say that the evangelical Christians, and maybe we have some evangelical Catholics or Christians among us this evening who don't have a space. We just believe that what the Bible says and Jesus saves and things like that is what matters. The World Council of Churches saying, no, we really have to look at ecology as well. And then my final, the final person I want to discuss this evening, and we've got a few minutes left, is Patriarch Bartholomew. So he's the patriarch, the ecumenical patriarch. He's the, the patriarch of Constantinople. But as patriarch of Constantinople, he's the patriarch of all the um, Orthodox churches around the world. The, the Russian, the Serbian, the Ukrainian, the Egyptian, the Ethiopian, the Greek Orthodox churches. He's so among Orthodoxy, he's like the the most, he's the, the one to whom they look for most of their teaching. And he and Pope Francis have had a long standing and a very cordial relationship. And Pope Francis quotes the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew in Laudato Si. And he's quoting the ecumenical patriarch, Patriarch Bartholomew's care for the environment and naming things which many Catholics haven't, haven't been prepared to name. And here's one thing here. And this is not the last, we've got one more slide and then that's it. Destroying biodiversity, climate change, deforestation, draining wetlands, contaminating water, land, air, and life. All of this degrades God's creation and all of this is sinful. And if it's sinful, we need to change. We need to move away from our sins. To commit crimes against the natural world is a sin against ourselves and is a sin against God. So when we abuse or when we misuse nature, Patriarch Bartholomew is being very, very harsh and he's calling a spade a spade as he sees it. He's saying this kind of, this kind of misuse of creation is sinful. And therefore, if it's sinful, we need to change. And then finally, um, I'll stop here. He gives a lecture at Utstein in the year 2003. And he's saying we have to look at our lifestyle. We have to learn to live on less. We have to replace consumption with sacrifice. We have to replace greed with generosity. We have to re replace our wastefulness with the spirit of sharing. We need to think more of what the world needs and less of what I want. So he's saying he's really, really challenging consumerism. Take, 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 have, 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 want, want, want. We have to learn to, uh, we can learn to have communion with God in everything that God has created. The Getting a new Bible, getting a new Bible app isn't going to make me necessarily closer to God. If I just look at what God has created, that will help me to become closer to God. I think that's our last slide. That is our last slide. And so I'll hand over back to Daddy Shlobo, Father Shlobo, and Father Shlobo can then field the rest of the conversation this evening. I'll stop sharing. And let's go in to... Thank you so much, Daddy Lox. Thanks for your... A presentation. Uh, I don't see any question on the chat box yet. Oh, there's one here. Uh, kindly advise who amongst all the popes that, in in your view, advocates for ecological conversion. I think every pope is ecological. I mean, those quotes, all of these modern popes whom I've quoted, going all the way back, going all the way back to um, to. Even John the 23rd in Pacham in Terrace, even John Pacham the 23rd, he's saying we have to be very, very careful of the way we look after and the way we, we use nature and the way we use natural resources. Then we've got, I've given us Paul the sixth. He's saying we need to change our ecologic, our, our economic models. We've been given uh, John Paul the second. We've given Pope Benedict. We've been given Pope John, Pope Francis. And I think every Pope is saying, that we need to change. We can't just carry on with business as usual. Thank you, Daddy. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we have any other question. And in the absence of no question, 
Oh, there's <laughs> something coming up. Mike has just put something here. Where can a school begin in its work with children who have no real contact with nature? How to help them fall in love with nature? That's a very, very good question because children are much, much more impressionable. I believe that um, there's a whole lot of work being done with schools. For example, there are these books by the Laudato Si movement, Planet Fraternity. Um, there's this one here. Um, what does that say? Religious education, religions and education towards a compact on education. Okay, there's this one here. Building together the global compact on education. Uh, there's this Jesuit education book, and each of these has ideas about how schools can be engaged in in caring for nature. The Catholic Institute of Education is kind of thinking a little bit remotely, but they're thinking of going and writing some kind of um, inspirational paper, some guidelines for environmental care in, in the schools. I would suggest we start by introducing children to basic, basic biology. If learners understand biology, that kind of trees produce oxygen, they consume carbon dioxide during the daytime when they're photosynthesizing, trees are necessary, trees are going to kind of make life more beautiful for us. We can teach children to plant, to plant plants. I remember we planted beans and I wasn't very successful at that when I was a kid. But then if we get children to plant a tree and then to continue to care for that tree as they go through school, grade one, grade two, grade standards one, et cetera, et cetera, as students progress through school and they can see maybe their tree becomes a home for insects or for birds. It's very, very difficult in many of our townships, many of which don't have much green space. And I think if, if we find some township schools, even city schools, um, my mother attended the convent on Oxford Road, the Holy Family Convent on Oxford Road. It was known then as Pocktown Convent. If you go to that convent at the moment, you'll see lots and lots of green. You'll see trees there. You'll see trees lining the road. And I think children learn something. It just humanizes, it just humanizes their space if they see green around them. Uh, so, okay. I mean, that's the uh, question there about schools. I think we've got three other questions. Uh, well, one is about uh, uh, Christian churches. Uh, is it, what about other Christian churches? Uh, you have mentioned evangelicals. And then there's one that says the elephant in the room is population growth. And your comments on that one. And there's one from Tony. Uh, was Bartholomew the one who started the season of creation? And... Okay, let, let me work backwards first. The easiest question, yes, Pope Bartholomew is the one who's identified with starting the seasons of creation. And now we've taken into the Catholic Church and other Christian denominations or churches celebrate the season of creation. That is the week leading up to the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, on the 4th of October. So the season of creation is now brought into the Catholic Church and we try to have creation-centered activities in our schools, in our parishes, in our churches. And so it was Pope Bartholomew. The elephant in the room is population growth. I, and I fully agree with Jane Halley there. And I think, I'm, I'm informed by books from the 1970s, Limits to Growth, I'm informed by um, planetary boundary theory, where the theory says there are limits. And Pope Francis and so the Catholic Church keep saying, so I'm going to quote Pope Francis here, instead of resolving the problems of the poor and thinking of how, we, how the world can be different, some can only produce, propose a reduction in birth rates. And so Pope Francis is saying, people are saying, reduce the birth rate. Pope Francis is saying um, demographic growth is fully compatible with an integral and shared environment development. Pope Francis is saying that demography can continue to grow, populations can continue to grow, and it's really a question of distribution. 
you have poor people because the wealthy are just consuming and wasting so much of the goods of the earth. So Pope Francis is saying demography can continue to grow. You'll find this in Laudato Si, the encyclical on care for our common home. Number 51. So whose question is this? Um, Jane Honey. If you go to number, number 50 of Laudato Si, you'll see Pope Francis is arguing that populations can continue to grow. I would think that's being rather optimistic or it's being rather, rather kind of, he's not particularly concerned about population growth. He's much more concerned about the inequity of distribution of the goods of the earth. Okay, um, so the limits to growth public, published by the, the, um, and the Club of Rome in 1972 says, just think about it, the earth is a limited space. It can't continue to grow and sustain more human food, human waste, and just human life. Africa has got tons and tons of space, and we, we're blessed with tons and tons of space. We've got lots and lots of arable land, but at some stage, we should say, this is great. Uh, God has given us what we have. Let's call it a day in terms of growth. So I know that goes somewhat against Pope Francis, whom I love and respect, but I think we really have to kind of put the brakes on somewhere. And that's a question of judgment. And he's got his judgment. I have a different judgment. Um, other Christian churches, uh, in response to Stephen Lowry, um, other Christian churches, like you've, I quoted for us, the World Council of Churches, their meeting in 1991, they've developed this theology of, of care for our, an eco-theology, care for our common home. There's Pope Bartholomew and the whole Orthodox churches, and that's basically the Eastern Christian churches are talking about care for our common home, the season of creation. And what's really, what's really new is that more evangelical Christians are recognizing the need for care for our common home. Okay. okay. Uh that enox, there are two, I think two or three other questions. Uh, quickly, one from uh, Nunu uh, it says, in essay, what impactful programs has the church implemented to promote environmental sustainability? And how have we addressed the intersection of environmental issues with social justice and human rights, and in particular, child rights? Wow. And Okay, I've only been in South Africa, so I'm I'm just kind of giving an excuse here. I've only been in South Africa for the last seven months. I've been in Kenya for the last 10 and a half years. So I think you should be able to speak more on behalf of what you were doing as members of the church in South Africa. Um, impactful programs. I hope that the churches at every level, schools at every level are talking about um, care for our common home, care for nature. Nature is God's gift to us. We are we are beneficiaries of God's great generosity. We didn't make ourselves. God has made us. God has made the world. Um, environmental sustainability. Look at your own parish, I think. This is a question from someone called Emmanuel. Um, Look at your own parish and say, what am I doing in my parish? How can I make life um, more valuable in my own parish, in my own school, in my own workspace? Am I planting trees? Am I kind of putting plants there? Am I squashing every mosquito that comes my way? Um, so I, I put the ball back in your court and say, let's, let's see what we can do together, how we can be an impactful church and relate that to children's rights. Children have a right to live in the future. Children don't need global climate change. Children don't need to be living on what Pope Francis calls an immense pile of filth. We really need to consider generations after us what Pope Benedict calls intergenerational solidarity. We have to be concerned about the children who are coming after us. In Africa, we, we talk of intergenerational solidarity as dependence on our ancestors, and we keep contact with our ancestors, and our ancestors inform us in the way we should behave. But intergenerational solidarity also means we have to think about the generations that are coming after us. We shouldn't be driving great big four by fours and gas guzzlers and pumping carbon dioxide into the environment. 
we should think that contributes to global climate change. My children and my children's children are going to suffer from global climate change. So that's that's what I would say um, we should be thinking about. Uh, there's okay. a question from someone here, there's... Mark. Yes. Do you want to uh, read that first, please, Ron? Just... Yeah. Uh... Op opponents of alternative energy argue that there is much higher upfront cost. The sun and the wind are inter inter intermittent sources, source of energy and, and we do not yet have storage capabilities. So backup energies will be required and there are geographic limitations, including environmental factors that could prevent building big wind or solar farms. How can we respond to the practical aspects of it? implementing green energy. Uh, just before you answer that one, I see we have five minutes before you go into darkness. Would you mind taking the other question and go just ahead. maybe try it? And then the second one is, uh, but our world, is, our world is still finite. We cannot just carry on with population growth or just, and then I have talked with other people who are of the conviction that the church is putting more focus than necessary on environmental issues, neglecting the poor and advancing the gospel of salvation. How would you answer this in a way that makes the person see the importance of the connectedness of this these juxta, juxtaposed issues, especially without making it seem as if caring for the environment is more urgent and important? And last one from Tony. You may want to mention our dis uh, discussion on family matters on Radio Veritas tomorrow morning. If you, oh, this is not a question, this is a publicity. Well, we can do, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's deal with the last one. So, Mrs. Tony Rowland, who's in charge of the family, the family desk in Johannesburg Archdiocese, and she and for the Catholic Bishops Conference here in Southern Africa, she has a radio program on Radio Veritas on Wednesday mornings at 10 o'clock, and she's asked me to be her guest tomorrow to continue this conversation on Radio Veritas tomorrow. So if any of you have the time or the inclination, please join us tomorrow on Radio Veritas at 10 o'clock. Um, at 9.30, that is, sorry, at 9.30. Oh, tell me more. No, no, she just wrote on the chat 30. box. 9.30, oh dear, yes. I must change my diary in that case. Okay, 9.30 tomorrow. Um, this question. So you can answer the questions, the, the, the two questions that. Uh... This question of rights, how do we communicate to people? You know, if there's no planet, there's no life. Um, one of our superiors used to say, when we boil only a little bit of water, as much water as we needed in the kettle, rather than kind of boiling a full two liters of water and just having one cup of tea, he, our superior used to say, uh, save the planet, but stuff the community. But if there is no planet, there is no community. If we're not caring for our world, then the poor and the the depri deprived and the those people who need to hear the message of salvation, salvation in Jesus Christ, they're not going to hear anything. And I think Bright's, prim Bright's question is premised on the idea that salvation is like pie in the sky when you die, if you're a good guy, that salvation is all about my eternal soul getting to heaven. But in fact, for many people, Salvation is about what do I eat tomorrow? My family is lost, my family is starving, my family is suffering from the effects of climate change. Salvation isn't something about another world after we all, after our bodies all die. Salvation is what people are concerned about today and tomorrow and the next day. So I think we have to be very, very careful not to put salvation into another world somewhere else. Um, and these are not juxtaposed issues, they all go together. I think they all fit together. It's a single conversation, it's a single discourse. We have to care for the earth in order to care for the people who are living on this earth. We have to feed the poor, but make sure that there are the resources available for the poor to be fed, for the homeless, that there are jobs, for etc. There's a question from Mark about sustainable energy or green energy. Yes, I mean, alternative energy. Yeah, I think it's very true that there are massive upfront costs about sustainable energy. 
But looking around the room today, I see that many of us, I'm presuming, okay, a good number of us have solar panels on our roofs at home, or we have inverters on our in our homes, or we have backup batteries. And that's those of us who can afford it. And that's what ESCOM is encouraging at the moment, is that people sort of almost put ESCOM out of business, that we wean ourselves off the dependency on a national energy provider, which isn't very, uh, which doesn't produce the goods. Um, it's expensive. It's very expensive. And the trouble is many people can't afford that and the environment can't afford that. I read in the newspaper this weekend that there's a massive um, uh, wind energy project going up in Kolcha, which has been delayed by 10 years because of environmental concerns. Kocha, I believe it's in the, the Western Cape, border of the West and the Eastern Cape. Uh, it's been delayed by 10 years because of concerns for a particular species of, of bird that lives there. Um, the world can't just, we can't just throw up energy, alternative energy infrastructure and expect the world to take that line down. There have to be considerations. And we have to think more widely about how uh, to install our alternative energy infrastructure. And it's costly. And these batteries require lithium, for example. Where is lithium obtained? It has to be, it has to be mined. It's expensive to mine it. But I think the, the calculus or the calculation down the line is that in time, energy, alternative energy begins to pay off, even in environmental terms. It may be expensive on the environment at the moment, but in years to come, this will be ecologic, ecologically and economically sensible to continue to invest in um, dinosaur technology and dinosaur mining, for example, mining more coal and looking for more oil is, I think, investing in something which doesn't have a future. I think the world is moving away from fossil fuels towards alternative or different modern forms of, of energy. And I think we should be on that, um, on that journey rather than going along with uh, more and more fossil fuel energy. And that is not, um, sorry, I have to, it's now we are two minutes, uh, almost two minutes after eight, and uh, I know you will be having load shedding soon. So uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. And just a reminder that next week we will have a, uh, uh, Another lecture, same time and uh, same same time uh, next to choose the same time and same uh, uh, Zoom details uh, to join our meeting next week. Thank you, everybody, and once again, Dr. Knox, thanks for your insights and for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Just a reminder that this is this will be available tomorrow on the on the YouTube channel of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. So if you missed the first two, you can find them. And tomorrow, this one will go up on the, the YouTube channel of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank Good you evening. very much. Bye. Bye.